www.thepeopleshow.com. Okay, uh, before we start, I'd like to say that Kingston is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We acknowledge that settler colonialism remains a problem today as it has been in the past. And we say this especially because we are all here to talk about climate change tonight. Settler colonialism and climate change are closely related. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Moore. Stephen teaches sustainability and environmental policy and ecological economics at Queen's University. Stephen also ran an off the grid organic farm on solar power, designed and built an earth sheltered home incorporating many sustainable features and has over 100 popular publications to his credit in the fields of environment and energy. Welcome Stephen, I will mute. for that uh, introduction. I am actually delighted to, um, I'm, I'm such a fan of 350.org that uh, I'm talking about it in my classes all the time. And uh, so I'm really happy to, you know, be able to give one small bit uh, toward the, uh, the great work that you're doing. Um, I see lots of familiar names. I'm gonna have a quick, uh, I'm looking over to the right because I have another screen over here, a quick shout out to Kayla and Paul and probably lots of others that I've forgotten, uh, but welcome. And um, please feel free to ask lots of questions because that's what makes these kinds of things really interesting. Um, I, I'm hoping I can stay within that 20 minute uh, limit. You know, uh, some of you probably know what it's like when uh, you, know, you let an academic have the microphone, uh, but I'll, I'll uh, try to stay uh, within that limit if I possibly can. Um, I'm going to share my screen and you should be looking at a slide that says climate interactive. Uh, and if you're not uh, somebody, I'm sure will probably let me know. Um, this uh, is a really interesting um, website. Throughout these slides, you'll see links at the bottom, and um, I've made the slides available. Uh, so, and I'm fine with sharing them. So, uh, you know, uh, it's fine with me if you don't quite catch the links. But I just put this up to show how deficient our leaders are in terms of addressing climate change. The promises, uh, the, these are in blue, the promises will take us to 3.2. Uh, business as usual will take us to 4.1. And as you know, we're looking to try to stabilize somewhere about 1.5 to 2, although that's out the window, as I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about economics, but also about some other things. I mean, if we look at what climate change, the estimates what climate change is likely to cost us versus the COVID-19 crisis, another crisis. Um, COVID-19 might cost us $4 billion, uh, or $4 trillion. Uh, the climate crisis might cost us $600 trillion, which is a big chunk of the uh, global economy. When I teach sustainability, and I'll talk a little bit about ecological economics maybe uh, later, but when I teach sustainability, I just want to let you know sort of what I talk about. It's not only sort of physical sustainability. I talk about universal human rights and social justice and transparency uh, and the, serving the public interest more than the private interest. Uh, making sure no stakeholders are disadvantaged, which might mean something like making sure that someone who lives next to a production facility doesn't have uh, worse uh, air and water. Uh, that wealth is distributed fairly uh, equally uh, and that we can stay within the Earth's carrying capacity for resource use and waste disposal, a fairly high bar that we're not really very close to reaching. So following on that, you should know my bias. Uh, my bias is that air, food, water, and shelter are all more important than wealth for the very few. Uh, that our, I think our current business models endanger those gifts of air, food, water, and shelter. Uh, if it's business as usual, the humans are probably going out of business. 
uh, and that we really do require optimism and mobilization. Uh, just a quick uh, snapshot, um, Feb 14 yesterday. Uh, of course, we're aiming to keep the uh, greenhouse gas level below 350 parts per million. The daily average at Moana Loa uh, was 412 parts per million. Uh, the change over the last year has been 1%. And the average uh, GHG level for the last million years has been 250 parts per million. So we're way over the average. The last time uh, CO2 concentrations were as high as they are today, our ancestors looked like this. The latest research also shows that the Paris Accord is irrelevant. Uh, more than two degrees C is already locked in uh, by the amount of carbon that we have in the atmosphere already. Um, this, you can look at this in uh, nature climate change. We have to keep in mind that if we stopped emissions tomorrow, the earth is still going to warm for 50 more years. One of the reasons that this is locked in is the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. Um, that is the only ocean that is not yet warmed significantly. And so far that ocean uh, is cool enough so that it can form cl cause clouds to form that reflect sunlight and further cool the planet. But when that region will warm too, um, it'll disperse the clouds and we'll have raising temperatures. The last bit is, I'm always reminded of a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter, where he says that every one of humans' major 24 civilizations have collapsed. And the patterns are strikingly similar. Uh, the first thing that, one of the, the, the aspects is that environmental degradation begins to affect healthy functioning. Another vector is that investments required to maintain an overly complex infrastructure are too costly and we don't maintain our infrastructure. And the third one is the elites through repression and austerity squeeze the masses harder until the edifice collapses. I don't know if those sound familiar to you, but they sound a little bit familiar to me. Uh, and this collapse often leaves behind decentralized autonomous pockets of human communities. A year ago, Antarctica was warmer than Los Angeles. It was 69 degrees Fahrenheit on Feb 21. Uh, about three months later, the Arctic uh, hit 104 Fahrenheit, the hottest temperature on record. It seems like all the ice in the world is melting except what's in my driveway. One of the reasons that we're doing this, I think, or that we're on this path is that we think like Ptolemy. Uh, many of you probably know of Claudius Ptolemy. This is when he was in his prime, about the time the Romans were building uh, Hadrian's Wall. And he came up with a very uh, good, at the time, uh, idea that the Earth was in the center of the solar system. And this predicted a lot of the motions of the planets. It, and it was good for a couple thousand years, but it really skewed the thinking of people at that time. And I think now we're thinking like Ptolemy because we think the economy is at the very center of the universe. And we forget that everything we have is due to a healthy biosphere. We're in the midst of neoliberal economics, where the sermon is that well-being comes from consumption, economies must grow, free trade makes nations wealthier, and governments should let markets do their magic. And this creates a false dichotomy of earth versus economy. Well, we can't really do that much about the environment because uh, it's going to hurt the economy. And I'm pretty convinced that that is a false dichotomy. Well, for instance, what if, um, imagine that oh, the human economy disappeared overnight. What would be the response of Earth's natural systems? It would probably be universal rejoicing. 
what if Earth's natural systems disappeared overnight? What would be the response of the human economy? Well, the human economy would completely disappear. So I don't think there's much question about which is dependent on which. Here are 20 countries in the last two decades that have reduced their GHG emissions while growing their economies. 20 countries have done this, and you'll notice Canada isn't on the list. But it absolutely is possible. In fact, it's imperative uh, that we reduce our annual GHG emissions and take a broad range of measures if we are to maintain some semblance of just an equitable life on this planet. I think we have to think like Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus, um, the 3,000 years, 4,000 years after uh, Ptolemy. Um, he was in his prime when Henry VIII was uh, expanding his waistline. And of course, he believed that the sun was in the center of the solar system. And that Copernican shift created a blossoming of astronomy and physics and related sciences. And I think that if we shift our current idea that the, and believe that the economy is not the center of our world, in fact, we will have sustained economic progress and human dignity. So what is that gonna require? Well, I think it requires principles of ecology to establish the framework for economic policy. And I think economists and ecologists have to work together to fashion a new economy. What would that look like? Well, what I teach in ecological economics is, you know, I try to draw from healthy ecologies as much as possible. A healthy ecology has diversity. What do we have? We have global monopolistic capitalism. A healthy economy has efficient natural cycles of food and waste. Nothing is wasted. Everything is another organism's food. And as you saw in the last, uh, last week, we have useless upstream waste that is 70 times the mass of the downstream products that we then have to bury or incinerate or do something with. A natural healthy ecology is self-sufficient. It only needs air and sunlight. But our economy requires endless tinkering with fiscal and monetary adjustments to try to keep it running. A healthy ecology is self-regulating. When things get out of whack, things naturally come back into balance. We have a business cycle of boom and bust, which we have somehow come to believe is normal. We have stimuluses, we have subsidies, we have tax breaks, we have all kinds of methods to try to keep this economy regulated. A healthy ecology has resiliency through self-renewal and we have an interlocked financial and power grid systems that require bailouts. So there are lots of solutions. And most of them are within our grasp. I think that's the most important part. Uh, we can get, we can feel really depressed and we can feel, um, you know, as though the end of the world is imminent. Um, but yet we know how to have healthy economies and healthy ecologies. This, I think, is an excellent TED Talk. 100 Solutions to Reverse War. Uh, and these researchers led by Chad Frischman uh, looked at, did some measurements of all the different kinds of solutions. And they came down with ones that seemed to have the biggest impact. Uh, and I was surprised at what they were. You might be too. Uh, number one was redesigning refrigeration. Number two was family planning and women's education. Then it was having a local economy to reduce transportation costs. It was to rever reversing globalization and free trade, reducing north-south inequality, regulating corporations, subsidizing renewables, not fossil fuels, and developing international cooperation. Those 
were the most, according to his research, were the most effective ways to um, combat or reduce or mitigate or whatever word you want to use, climate change. Now, to a certain extent, Canada is doing this. We have to, you know, give uh, our leaders a little bit of choice. Uh, Trudeau has uh, proposed uh, a carbon tax, and this fits in line with Norhout, who won the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, because he said the most efficient remedy is a global scheme of carbon taxes. And in fact, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank's repo man uh, says that carbon tax is the most powerful way to fight the climate crisis. And the government of Canada, uh, along with most, some principles and territories, provinces and territories agreed to a carbon tax. And they, the proposal was that the carbon price should start at a minimum of $10 per ton in 2018 and ratchet up to about 170 in 2030. Unfortunately, this was opposed by certain provincial uh, premiers who challenged this in court, who seemed to have trouble grasping the idea of the, a national identity. For years now, Mark Jacobson at Stanford has been saying renewables are within our grasp. He's been saying that there are no technological or economic barriers to converting the entire world to clean renewable energy. And he says, for instance, 4 million turbines would produce 50% of the world energy use. Now that's gonna take a lot of resources and we have to always remember that increasing supply takes resources. But 4 million sounds pretty big until you realize that in 2019, our global production of cars and light trucks was 91 million. And if you kind of figure that maybe 20 cars and trucks would equal almost one turbine, we already have the industrial capacity to produce 4 million turbines in one year. There was a declaration just last week from the Renewable Energy Global Strategy Group. Uh, and they made three points. A world based on 100% renewable energy is possible. We are able to transform the entire energy system fast enough to avoid the climate catastrophe, and we can do it by 2030. And I'm convinced we absolutely can do this. Uh, if you look at back at, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about lessons we can learn from World War II, within six months, we transformed our industrial economy, and we can do it again. These are some of the people in this joint declaration of the strategy. That's Mark right there. It's a combination of NGOs and universities. There, there's a full 10-point de declaration. I'm not going to go through every point, but I'm going to flip through them like this, and we can always come back to them if you want. One thing that critics of renewable energy say is, oh, well, the sun doesn't shine all the time, and the uh, uh, wind doesn't blow all the time. Uh, but they forget that we have batteries, uh, and that the wind is always blowing somewhere. And our base load ability, based on um, an um, article in Energy Science, and this is also due to some of the work by Mark Jacobson, is that solar, wind, hydroelectrics, and concentrated solar power can, in, by, with his models, met California's hourly demand 99.8% of the time. So we know how to do it with the proper mix. And here's the, uh, here's the reference for that. Another criticism is land use. Well, 100% of world energy for all purposes needs 0.4% of the world's land. And this is mostly solar. The spacing between institutions is another 0.6%. In Northern Africa, there is a, an installation called Desert Tech. And what De Desert Tech is uh, already sending power through this uh, high voltage DC power line to power a lot of England. And this red square indicates the amount of land that would be required to produce all the world's energy needs through solar. 
this amount of land to produce the EU's needs, this amount of land to produce um, the Middle East and North Africa, this amount if we concentrated that solar power. If we look at renewables versus oil right now, today, a hundred billion dollar investment in wind or solar energy will produce four times as much energy as the same investment in oil. There's no longer any business case for oil. By 2035, solar energy will, will be about double of oil and offshore wind energy could be six times the energy return of our current oil resources. On top of that, renewables create more jobs. The gas sector is uh, relatively low job creating because it's so capital intensive. For every million dollars invested, oil and gas creates two jobs. For every million dollar invested, clean energy creates 15. So job creation would be a tremendous boon if we could make the transition. Renewables are also safer jobs. If we look at, now this is a funny stat, I know, but the global death rate per trillion kilowatt hours of power generation. And these are people who are working inside the industry. Well, you have 100,000 deaths in the coal mining industry per trillion kilowatt hours. You have 36,000 deaths in oil, 4,000 in natural gas, 440 in solar and 150 in wind. That's people working inside the industry. For the people who are uh, the other stakeholders who are around the industry and affected by it, in 2018, this study found that 8.7 million people died prematurely due to pollution released by fossil fuels, mostly particulates. That's 18% of the total global deaths that year, nearly double previous estimates of 4.2 million deaths annually. So fossil fuels are not only bad for the climate, they're bad for us, they're bad for air quality. What do our subsidies for fossil fuels cost us? Well, Canada spends about $4.8 billion a year in handouts to the fossil fuel industry. That would pay for K-12 education for all the students in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, PEI, New Brunswick, Yukon Territories, Northwest Territories, and none of it. That same 4.8 billion, if we want to use it another way, would provide job training for 480,000 workers. Way more than twice as many workers as are in the current oil and gas and mining industries. Or if we wanted to use it another way, it would pay for the annual health care costs of 880,000 people, everyone in New Brunswick, Yukon Territories, and Northwest Territories. So there may be better ways to use some of those fossil fuel subsidies. Norway has been in the news a lot lately due to a famous ad. And I thought I'd just take a minute to compare. Why is Norway doing so good compared to Canada and certainly compared to the US? In the 2021 Climate Change Performance Index, Norway ranked eight out of 61 countries measured. Canada was at the bottom, 58th out of 61 countries measured. Norway exports about 1.7 billion barrels a day to Western Europe. The oil, and, and it's always controversial, it is, should the oil you export be included in your emissions? Some say yes, some say no, but Norway exports 10 times more oil than its domestic emissions. Canada produces much more oil, 4.7 million barrels a day to the US, but yet we only export four times more emissions than we produce domestically. Norway is a world leader in our electric vehicle sales. Canada, 3.3% of passenger vehicles during the first half of 2020 were electric. 
Norway has a state-controlled oil company, Equinor. This oil company and the government jointly determine climate policy and Canada petroleum corporations control production and investment. And they're accountable only to their shareholders. Norway has a unitary state. So the government has uncontested authority over climate policy. Canada has a federal state with divided jurisdictions and endless bickering between the feds and the provinces. Norway has a high degree of political stability on climate action. Canada has splits along party lines and according to geography. Norway consults with labor unions and NGOs. That's viewed as essential in Canada that, that rarely happens. Norway has lower levels of inequality and a stronger social safety net than Canada. And Norway has a sovereign wealth fund that holds $1.3 trillion in global investments while Alberta squandered its oil wealth on low provincial taxes and corporate giveaways. If we look at jobs per sector, Statistics Canada tells us that in 2018, these were the jobs per sector. And you'll notice that mining plus quarrying plus oil and gas was 15th. 203,000 jobs. I don't think anybody can say with a straight face that oil and gas is the backbone of the Canadian economy. If we look at those extractive industries versus green energy, those extractive industries together are 5% of Canada's GDP, much higher in Alberta. But green energy is 3% of Canada's GDP, more than the agriculture sector, more than the forestry sector, more than the hotel and restaurant sector. The amount, the number of people, 203,000 jobs in the mining and quarrying and oil and gas sector is about the same number as work for one company, George Weston Limited. And it's about half the number that work in fast food restaurants in Canada. The green sector has more jobs than oil and gas and mining and quarrying, 300,000. More than real estate, rental and leasing, more than mining, quarrying and oil and gas. I think it's important to know these numbers. So what do we need? Well, we need conservation and we need efficiency. And those who know me in my classes know that sometimes I'm a little bit provocative. And so I'm also going to say that we focus at, we should focus on everyone in Canada, not just the relative fewer employed in oil and gas, although it is essential that we take care of the people employed in oil and gas. Absolutely, We're, we absolutely should not just let them drift away or drift into poverty. But we have to stop acting as if the oil and gas industry is equal to the rest of Canada. And we have to focus on production where there are fewer players rather than consumption where there are many players. We need two revolutions. We have to reduce demand and we have to shift to energy efficient technologies. And uh, plan B, which was written a few years ago said, uh, I think 15 years ago that we have to cut net carbon dioxide emissions by 80% by 2020, which unfortunately we haven't done. Per dollar spent, conservation and efficiency, that's the little green bar over there. That is uh, by far the biggest bang for the buck. And that does not include environmental or climate benefits. And there are all kinds of really neat, efficient ideas. We also have to focus on producers. And I'll tell you why. For one thing, I think this is why the environmental movement has largely failed. If you think about it, the environment provides everything we need to produce or find or gather the necessities of life, clean air, clean water, housing, transportation. 
And the environment provides all of that. And if there's anything that we depend on, it is how the necessities of life are produced. So why do we ignore production? We ignore production because it's a class issue. We ignore class. We don't think about who actually controls the production of energy and food and housing and medicine. Who controls who produces what we need for life? We know that environmental destruction is largely caused by those who control production. There's lots, cement, steel, minerals, chemicals, industrial agriculture, in the guise of corporations and a wealthy class turning nature into profit. And the worker class that doesn't have as much capital or power then has to work for the class that owns production. And this is where the environmental movement has missed out. The environmental movement has not addressed the people who are actually working who, if they walked off the job, could actually control production. The right wing knows this. They absolutely use class to oppose environmental proposals. And they direct their message to workers who don't have economic or political power to own farms, factories, mills, labs, or housing developments. And their messages are, oh, those nasty environmentalists, they'll cost you jobs, they'll lower your standard of living. These environmental movements are gonna make you do it less and inhibit your freedom. And unfortunately, that message is winning. All we have to do is look at, well, here's an example. Here is a from 42, 2021, where climate activists are opposed to labor unions. It wasn't always like that. In the 1960s, especially in the US, it was understood that industrial producers were causing damage and dumping toxins not only into the environment, but into their workers' bodies. As a result, there were three pieces of legislation that I still think are the most important far-reaching pieces of legislation uh, in the history of North America. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. They worked. One of the reasons they worked is a fellow named Tony Mazaki. And for a long time, I had never heard of him and I wouldn't be surprised if, if you didn't hear of him either, but he was a union man. He worked for the oil, chemical, and atomic workers. He was credited by Richard Nixon as the primary force behind enactment of the Occupational Self and <laughs> Safety and Health Act of 1970. He was a mentor to Carol Silkwood. He's been called the Rachel Carson of the American workplace. What he understood, and this is what he said, when you start to interfere with the forces of production, you are going to the heart of the beast. He knew that pollution always starts in the workplace. And he knew that there was a tendency for factory owners to put profit over their workers' safety. And so he had the workers threaten to walk off the job for the, their own safety and the safety of the environment. In the 60s, Unions and workers were right on board environmental protection. And those three laws used the power of the state to force capitalists to spend money to ensure a safer workplace and a safer environment. It was a successful class-based intervention. Today, the environmental movement is rooted mostly in the professional class of which I am a, absolutely a member but that's only 22% of the workforce. But the professional class is all about credentials. It's all about degrees. It's all about knowledge uh, to gain an, uh, an advantage to a better life. The focus on education, on meritocracy. 
Who are the leaders of the environmental movement? Well, science communicators. Now, journalists, scientists, NGO professionals, professors, government workers. And I admit I'm in this group and we're horrified. We're deeply invested in the politics of knowledge and science. And we are offended by science denial. And we think that if only everybody knew the facts, things would change. And that's not true. And it's obviously not about production. It does not speak to the daily concerns of most people. It's a misguided message and it's not working. The other group are policy technocrats who try to outsmart climate change with, with uh, cap and trade, carbon pricing, rising costs of energy. Some of those are really good things. But raising the cost of energy to pay for the damage, that does not speak to the monthly concerns of people who are just hanging on. And they are not going to be interested in preserving the environment if preserving the environment means that they have to do with less. It's not their daily monthly concern right now. The other disadvantage is that there's relative material comfort of our professional class. And part of our environmental politics are rooted in anxiety about our own individual consumption. And the right wing absolutely exploits this. Common question, maybe if you go to a, an environmental panel, well, how did you get to this meeting tonight? Did you drive a car? And our guilt makes us back off. And the right wing would like nothing better than for environmentalists out of guilt to abandon all modern forms of transportation and communication to live in caves and write on birch bark. Bill McKibben addresses this directly. He says environmentalists also live in the world we're trying to change. And that changing the system, not perfecting our own lives is the point and hypocrisy is the price of admission in this battle. The message, do more with less is failing. It does not make sense to workers, to most people who are just hanging on. It antagonizes them. It makes them ripe for right-wing appeals. And we have to harness worker power, not as victims of the transition, but to drive the transition. Okay, I'll be quiet. Uh, oh God, I went overboard, but uh, anyway, I will stay and answer questions as long as you want to stay here with me. So uh, uh, I'm really interested to have uh, a discussion. Thank you, Stephen. That was incredibly interesting and uh, really reframed the whole thing in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> that was the point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to open it up to um, questions from the chat window. Um, but I'd like to ask a question first. Sure. And my question is, um, do we need something like the War Measures Act to initiate this sort of change? Um, I think absolutely, and I'm going to skip if it's okay to a, a slide, because I've got some other slides here that I was hoping might add to the questions. Um, I've been reading a book that I thought is really good, and it's called A Good War, and it, uh, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. It's by Seth Klein, Naomi's brother, who is with the CCPA, it is a fabulous book. It is very detailed, it talks about all different kinds of sectors and uh, what we really have to do in order to win this battle for climate change, we have to have a national mobilization. I think you are just, uh, you know, bang on Jude. He talks about four different things, well, many, but I boiled it down to four. We have to spend to win. We have to stop worrying about debt, and we have to finance that to win this war. And we can finance that 
through government bonds like war bonds, through um, bonds issued by the central bank, not by private banks. And we absolutely can finance this debt. We have to create new financial institutions to handle the depth, the breadth of this war. In World War II, there were 28 crown corporations created to put Canada on a war footing. So far, as far as I know, we've created zero for climate change. He also says we have to move from incentives to mandated action. And I mean, it's, it's even hard enough now to get people to wear masks for COVID-19. Um, but we have to turn that around. And maybe the way to turn that around, and this is one of his excellent points, I think, is we have to tell the truth. We have to rally the public. We have to use the arts. In World War II, there were all kinds of songs and theater and movies and all kinds of stuff about the war effort. And it encouraged people. And in terms of climate change, I think we have too many engineers and not enough poets. So the result of this is really a Green New Deal plus. And Kyla is going to talk about a Green New Deal a little uh, late in the spring. Uh, and I'll be tuning in on that because she knows more about it than I do. But the Green New Deal plus means the abolition of the idea of perpetual growth. It means pricing externalities and not allowing producers to make taxpayers clean up their pollution. It means a rapid exit from fossil fuels. It means strict regulation of markets and property acquisition. It means reining in corporate lobbying and the financing of election campaigns. It means the empowerment of women. It means addressing population growth and it means more equitable standard of living. So yeah, absolutely, I think we need um, a national mobilization. And again, I'll uh, encourage you. Uh, there's some, I think, what's, I think, some really good stuff in this. A good war. Well, well, thank you. That was um, really positive solutions. That uh, I mean, they're huge, but <laughs> at least they have pointing us in the right direction. Okay. Well, absolutely, we did it once. I mean, there are things that we did during World War II that we do not want to do again, forced internment. I mean, there's all kinds of those, but we did it once. We can do it again. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to remind everyone, get your questions in the chat window, and if you can preface them with three stars, that'll help Leslie find them. Okay, over to you, Leslie. Okay, lots of uh, questions and comments here in the chat. Um, so um, I, I'll start with the questions. If we have time to get to the comments, we can maybe do that later, but I'll just go with the direct questions first. Um, so the first question is, how do I answer the question that is so often posed? Yeah, but what about China? Canada is too small to make a difference. I, well, I think that means two things. If, if you were walking down the street and saw someone assaulted, would you say, I'm only one person. I'm not enough to make a difference. I think that's a result of very individualistic thinking and not thinking about um, a totality. If, for instance, Canada went on a national mobilization and restricted all products above a CO2 footprint, you can bet that large countries, if they wanted to market here in Canada, would move in the same direction. And the more countries that do that, the better. On the other hand, even if we take all these measures at least we're, we've done something. And at least we can feel as though we've made a difference. It's almost like the Buddhist idea where, you know, you can try, try your hardest to do what you think is right, but don't be attached to the outcome. Don't suffer 
because you didn't make as big an impact as you did. I think we're too small to make a difference is just an excuse for not changing. And I'd like to, I'll ask a question. Are you a good ancestor? When your children and grandchildren talk to you after you're dead, will they say you were a good ancestor? Or will they say that you thought you were too small to make a difference? That's a great answer, Stephen. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what about degrowth in the wealthy countries and moving towards a global steady state economy? Yeah, I'm a fan of James Daly and degrowth. Uh, although I, I think it's really important uh, what we choose to degrow. Again, this goes back to sort of what I uh, was talking about, you know, and when I was talking about the workers. Um, there are some things that absolutely need a lot of growing, like food for everyone and clean water and clean air and uh, uh, affordable transportation and housing. Those things absolutely have to grow. But there are many other things uh, that we absolutely could afford to degrow. Uh, I think the tricky part is the, okay, the, uh, the rich and powerful uh, are, are the one who, it's their possessions that we should degrow and they're the rich and powerful, which makes it a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, but I quite agree with that. I mean, the, um, the date at which uh, we used up more of Earth's resources than Earth can regenerate is now at the end of August. It used to be in July. Now, this is, you know, like the tax date. Um, but we're eating into our capital. We're using more resources than uh, Earth can possibly regenerate. And, and that cannot go on forever. Uh, and, and it creates all kinds of dislocation and deaths. And if, if an, goodness, uh, indigenous people around the world had better not be living on top of something that a North American capitalist wants because they'll be moved off. And, and we just can't continue that. So yes, I think degrowth and most of the principles of degrowth are great. But it really depends how you phrase them, but because just the idea of degrowth is not going to resonate with people who are just hanging on as it is. Thank you. Um, the next person says they are curious about the calculation that puts a cost for climate catastrophe as about $600 trillion, when the cost of trashing the planet is both infinite and unsurvivable. Does this fallacy point to the core problem that we value only what we produce and exploit while we neither value the natural resources when they are unexploited, nor those activities that are working to return us to a natural state? Did you get oh. off that? <laughs> oh yeah, I think you're absolutely right. But I think for most people to really understand and to, and to get a grip on that because it it is an, what you say is absolutely, I agree with 100%. Uh, but for many people, they don't think that way. Uh, and so there's always this sort of um, struggle between, you know, the pure way of phrasing something and a way of phrasing something that might have a chance of persuading others. And uh, I don't think there's any great answer to that. But I think you're quite right. Um, the um, even if even two degrees uh, will probably cost more than six hundred trillion, and uh, but unless you put it in those terms, some people just don't pay attention. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, let me see if I can phrase this question. The next person um, has a question about nuclear energy um, being classified as a, a green energy and that may be um, wondering if we should not um, 
the stating the reduction of consumption as the primary goal rather than the use of green energy as a replacement when it may not always be so green? Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I quite agree with that. And I'm going to skip down to, I think, anybody who says that the nuclear industry is a green industry doesn't know what they're talking about, or they failed to take into account most of the important metrics. Um, this chart shows you the total emissions in uh, grams per CO2 per kilowatt hour produced. And you'll notice that nuclear is higher than any of them except coal. And I mean, there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, for one thing, it takes these giant massive containment vessels uh, that are made out of concrete that has a big footprint. Uh, there, um, and you have to mine the uranium, you have to transport it, you have to refine it, all kinds of things. So you, yes, you are absolutely right. But the way to do it, I think, we have, we have to reduce demand. But I don't think we can reduce demand by telling people that you're going to have to walk around with your lights off half the time. I think the only way that we can effectively reduce demand is making sure that um, lights that aren't needed, like on, I see houses with their exterior lights on all night long, all the time, uh, that may not be needed. But efficiency, if we can get more light out of the same amount of energy or more heat out of the same amount of energy, uh, then that is a way to actually reduce that demand because if we get 20% more lighting, uh, the same amount of energy, then we can reduce our energy 20% and we're right back where we started from. Um, there's lots about uranium nuclear and I'm gonna, because nuclear is a, often a big deal for people in the nuclear industry. And I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time, uh, oh, three or four slides. Solar products projects can be built in less time and at a lower cost than a single nuclear project. Even when accounting for capacity and the energy produced from a nuclear facility, large scale solar farms are less expensive and quicker to bring online than nuclear. Amory Lovins, who is one of my very favorite geeks um, from Rocky Mountain Institute says that nuclear power is in slow motion commercial collapse around the world. It's a waste of time and money in the climate fight. Now I mentioned something about baseload before with uh, that, uh, that renewables can provide our, our base load. Base load is the idea that, well, you have to have this constant uh, amount of energy produced all the time to meet uh, the demand, the minimum demand. And then at certain times you have to produce more uh, to meet higher demand. And, and nuclear plants are very good at running constantly and um, producing this bottom amount of base load. Well, I did a little research on that. And the research that uh, Atomic Energy Canada comes out with does not include planned and unplanned outages and repairs. And so they claim that nuclear reactors run about 85% of the time. Now, when I included and, and you can do this, you can go to IESO and uh, you can see a list of all the uh, energy producers in Ontario anyway, all the Pickering plants, all the Darlington plants, all the wind, all the power, all the solar, uh, all the, all the hydropower. When I include planned and unplanned outages, Ontario's overall nuclear reliability comes in at about 57%, which is less than renewable. And if you go to IESO, look at hourly output and capability and look at the Clean Air Alliance. So there's no case for nuclear being a reliable base load. There's no business case for nuclear, uranium nuclear at all. It's more expensive, it's more dangerous, it's unreliable. It'll produce 10,000 years of waste. There's no commercial activity. Nobody, private, no 
private company won't touch these things. You can't get insurance for them. And global nuclear power peaked in 2006. Now, because I was involved in a hydroponic startup producing um, uh, indoor uh, a greenhouse producing greens, I was invited by OPG to uh, a meeting to come up with ideas to repurpose uh, the land at the four Pickering nuclear plants, because those can only operate safely until 2024. And OPG told me that decommissioning those plants is going to cost at least $60 billion and it's going to take at least 20 years. Now those numbers are never factored in to the cost of nuclear energy. They're never, they're never factored into the promises up front and there's no pot of money sitting around that's going to pay for that $60 billion except you and me. It's really too bad that the US went toward uranium nuclear because there are also thorium reactors. These are nuclear reactors. And there's a really good, uh, at this link, there's a really good TED talk on, this is my second favorite geek, uh, liquid fuel thorium reactor. It is safer, it is cleaner, and it is more efficient than current nuclear power and thorium is widely available. And it's not toxic, you can hold it in your hand. But unfortunately after World War II, <clears throat> when the US was looking for new sources of power, the US military demanded that they focus their technology on uranium nuclear because the US military wanted to use excess uranium to enrich into plutonium to make bombs to kill people. It's very unfortunate that the world went that way because there are other kinds of nuclear that tend to show a lot more promise. Boy, that's a long answer to a relatively short question, but, but if you have more questions, of course, uh, uh, but nuclear, I don't, I don't consider to be a green energy at all. Thank you. Um, I am conscious that it's eight o'clock. We do have several more questions. Um, I can stick around, whoever what. Anybody else wants to, fine with me. Okay, maybe Jude, I'll let you um, sort of close up and then whoever can stay will, will can stay for more questions. Okay, great, yeah. Um, Basically, um, I just want to say to everyone that um, we have a, this same time next week, we have a talk uh, by Dr. Kathy Vakil on uh, climate change and health. And we hope you can join us then. And, and uh, we really appreciate everyone joining us on a long weekend. And um, yeah, stick around to hear more of this uh, gripping conversation. Okay, so the next question is, uh, do you think that one necessary step in mobilizing workers in the struggle for environmental justice is a universal basic income? Boy, that's a really good question. And to tell you the truth, I haven't really connected those two that much. And I'd have to think about that. Um, <clears throat> I think a universal basic income is a really good idea. Uh, and I think it would certainly um, take away some of the desperation of hourly and daily workers and maybe allow them to, um, the freedom to be able to think about other things other than how much money is going to be uh, left at the end of the month. And then they could start thinking about health issues and environmental issues. Uh, I know if you're afraid of losing your job, you're not going to speak up about somebody dumping, uh, you know, a bunch of gasoline in the parking lot. Uh, and, uh, and maybe a universal uh, um, minimum income would certainly help that. So people didn't have to be so afraid about being penalized or losing their jobs for speaking up. Thank you. Um, 
Next question, how do we get the professional class to reduce consumption? Well, that's, uh, <clears throat> I think the way to do it is to get the working class to cut off uh, those forms of dangerous consumption. If, and this is part of the uh, provocative controversial thing, uh, but I think, you know, what we need is food and uh, shelter and we de don't need more smartphones. We don't need more four wheelers. We don't need more riding lawnmowers. Um, and I think if, if we can mobilize people to understand that those things are not our right, that they are harmful, uh, and let's let unions shut down a couple of those factories that make those things, uh, then, um, then that might be the way. I mean, that might be part of the way of moving from incentives to mandatory, who knows? I mean, I'm just kind of thinking on the fly here, and I'm sure, you know, you're thinking lots of different things as well. Um, but again, I want to go back to, I mean, there are certain industries that are damaging and unnecessary when there are people starving and homeless. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. How much impact will the new electrification of transportation contribute to slowing climate deterioration? A lot, uh, if, it's, if it's actually done. Uh, about 82% of the oil used in North America is for transportation. It's not for electricity generation. So our fossil fuel problem in North America is a transportation problem. And if we could subsidize electric vehicles instead of fossil fuels, and if we could keep companies from suppressing the development of electric vehicles, if we could invest in charging stations. Uh, and the other neat thing about that is that the more electric vehicles we have, actually, the more it's going to balance out the grid because uh, vehicles typically sit idle 90% of the time, and uh, all, all those little batteries, all those little reservoirs can be used to balance out the uh, grid. And, uh, you know, we can, we can charge at times when we don't have peak power uh, demands, uh, and we can use some of that energy when we do have peak power demands. So I think investment in the electrification of transportation would be huge because that will pretty much take care of our fossil fuel problem. Right. Um, what is your advice to educators who want to be effective science communicators and engage their students in environmental activism? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, um, a couple a couple things, I guess. I would, I've been interested in and uh, kind of working with, through one of my students, uh, Haida Gwaii and Bella Bella on Canada's West Coast. And I found that um, they are reconstituting their societies based on a feeling of being grateful for nature. They're getting kids out in, and they're having all kinds of programs and they have been for years. And the initial kids who are in those, uh, I guess we would call them environmental education programs, but they'll go out and camp on the land and learn how to do things and learn their history and all that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, the kids who started in those programs are now the leaders of those programs. And that has really blossomed into an environmental consciousness. I mean, the answer is to, don't try to communicate the science. Um, get people, get kids out into nature, get them experiencing what it's like. Um, in many indigenous schools, the day begins with a half an hour of thankfulness 
for the air and the water and the woods and the animals and each other and all different kinds of things. And I know that in the country to the south, for instance, the day begins with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and, and the republic to which it stands. And I don't think that's any kind of way to develop an environmental consciousness. So I think if we can not talk about it to kids, but do it with kids, that that will develop an environmental consciousness with the provision that we don't have that much time. I think what we have to do now, if we want to solve this problem, is that we have to shut down the polluting industries. And 15 years from now, those kids that we engaged with nature will carry on with um, developing an environmental consciousness. But maybe we do it through political organizing. Maybe we do it, as I said, through unions. I think, you know, we re maybe we have to stand up and demand a little bit um, if we are going to be good ancestors. Thank you. Do you see the lessons in the UK's transition to renewables and in lowering carbon emissions? Oh yeah, I mean, there are lots of countries that have done that. I mean, Denmark's done that, Germany's done that to an extent. I mean, all of Scotland is powered by wind energy. I mean, we all we have to do is look around and, and see other people who are making this transition. Other governments that aren't in the pockets of the fossil fuel companies. Um, even in the US, if the 40 least efficient states just did what the 10 most efficient states are already doing, the US could cut its coal-fired power plants in half. So really, as I said, I mean, we can do this. We know how to do it. All we have to do is look around and copy the people who are doing it well. Um, since we need a national mobilization, how about Victory Gardens 2.0? Hmm. The success of Victory Gardens during World War II. Oh, absolutely. I think we've seen that to a certain extent in the, in the COVID-19 crisis. You know, I've, uh, I've been talking to people in garden stores and they say, my God, we're out of seeds. I mean, uh, this was last uh, spring. You know, everybody was buying seeds and planting gardens and doing, and, and so maybe, a national crisis, a national emergency will move people to doing things locally, doing things naturally, doing things for themselves, because we've really lost that. When, when my grandparents were growing up, it was a sign of prestige to have store-bought stuff. Now, it's a sign of prestige to have homemade stuff. And one of the reasons for that is if you have enough time to do that, then you have a better life. And so maybe we should think more about doing things for ourselves and for our neighbors. Um, I know that the COVID crisis is gonna put a block on that for a little while. But we could still plant our own garden and there's so much information available on you know how to grow your own food and uh, and, and the health benefits and uh, the exercise and it just goes on and on and on so i think victory gardens would be a you know a fabulous idea that would be part of the mobilization thank you um there's another question about nuclear but i think you addressed that already so uh, i'll move on to um please give a couple of examples of how Canada's economy could be more diverse and more self-regulating. <clears throat> well, one example would be to look at the largest companies and break them up. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, George Weston employs, and I'm not picking on George Weston necessarily, it just, it's in the slides. 
uh, George Weston employs as many people as the mining and quarrying and fossil fuel industry. Um, uh, look at the grip um, uh, of um, Irwin Oil in, in uh, Eastern Canada. Um, I mean, we can see examples all over the place of also um, Canadian companies being non-existent. Like we don't have our own pharmaceutical in industry. Uh, and, but now that's, uh, we're, we're starting to realize that maybe that would be an important thing. Um, you know, I think a nation of many smaller suppliers would go a long way toward uh, the true meaning of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. I don't know who's read that book or not, but uh, not many because it's written in 18th and 19th century style and it's not very easy to read, but it was written during a time when England was a nation of small shopkeepers and people didn't travel very far. Um, I think we should break up Amazon, break up the tech giants, uh, not or, or not allow them to trade in Canada um, unless they invest in Canada. One idea that I had was maybe one of the, maybe, I know these are outrageous and these are far out, but I, I don't want to talk about if it could be done. I just want to talk about what could be done. Maybe we should require every company that wants to sell in a jurisdiction in Canada, but maybe a province, they also have to manufacture, source and manufacture a certain percentage uh, and have a certain percentage of workers in Ontario. If Procter & Gamble doesn't want to sell any products in Ontario, fine. Um, if they do, they should have uh, production facilities and they should hire workers and they should manufacture in the jurisdiction in which they want to sell. That's one of the difficulties that we're finding with globalization, that it, uh, we become subservient to other countries, our own industries wither and die, and then we're forced to um, seek the things we need elsewhere. So that might be one way uh, to make um, Canada's um, economy a little more diverse. I mean, it's the old thing that we're the hewers of wood and the draw drawers of water and all of, and that's true. I mean, we have marvelous natural resources. A, na a country as rich as ours shouldn't have to import much of anything because we have so much here. Uh, I think if, I think it might be possible to um, create homegrown industries that can produce most things. As long as they're products that people need and not necessarily luxury items. But again, that would be a hard sell. Thank you. Um, here's an a interesting question. Uh, should we even attempt to speak to people who believe that their riches will protect them from climate issues. <laughs> um, oh yeah, well, well, maybe not speak to them about climate issues. Uh, oh yeah, I, um, sure. Uh, I mean, that's one of the problems with climate change is that many people feel that they can ride it out, uh, that it's gonna happen to someone else. Um, but maybe you want to gather examples of people in Sandy Hook who had very fancy houses and a hurricane destroyed them. Uh, people in Nor New Orleans, people in, I mean, there are all kinds of natural disasters you can point to and no, mat much, no matter how much money you have, you are not going to divert a hurricane. So that may be one of the, or you're not going to, to create rain. Uh, so you can own 10 million acres of Arizona, and if no rain falls on it, uh, you could probably make a living um, making tequila. But other than that, I'm not sure what you would be able to do. So, 
I think we can just kind of drop little examples uh, here and there. And you don't even have to engage them. You, you could say, oh, geez, you know, did you see here that somebody had a $3 million house in Sandy Hook that was destroyed by this hurricane? And, uh, you know, just, um, I would try that a little bit, uh, you know, rather than going into a full bore uh, uh, kind of headbutting sort of uh, energy sapping um, discussion. Thank you. Um, along those lines, uh, the next question that says, um, the changes we need to make are extremely disruptive to the way that people live. It seems that discomfort and opposition to change uh, that are built into people are some of the most significant barriers we might face. And so how do we deal with this? I don't think the changes we have to make are extremely disruptive. I don't think it's extremely disruptive if somebody doesn't have the latest uh, this year's riding lawnmower or the latest cell phone or uh, a 4,000 square foot house. Um, I don't, I think those are just, I mean, that's just what we think we deserve or we think we've earned. Uh, and that's a value kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> along with that, another idea I had uh, is to eliminate the tax deductibility of marketing and advertising, or at least put a cap on it. Maybe $100,000 a year is all you can deduct from your taxes for marketing and advertising if you're a business. That would certainly include most small businesses would, would be well within that cap. But a $600 billion global advertising industry to convince us that we need a perfect lawn and the latest car and the biggest truck. And I don't think that greed and selfishness are inherent in individuals. Otherwise, the humans never would have evolved. Uh, they never would have survived on their own individually. I think that's been marketed and advertised into us. And uh, I think if we s somehow could shut off that constant bombardment of we deserve this and we won't be happy until we have this, then changes won't be extremely disruptive. I think it's extremely disruptive for people to be hungry. I think it's extremely disruptive for people to be homeless. Great, thank you. Um, here's a, a question about technology. What happens to the solar equipment when its time is up and wind turbines and electric batteries? <clears throat> oh, that's a really good question. And in terms of solar panels, we're not sure when their time is up because we've had solar panels for 50 years and the same panels are still working. We used to think that we would lose 1% per year um, in uh, efficiency, but it seems like it's just a fraction, a hundredth of that maybe. So, but underneath that is, that's a, it's a really good point that you make. And that is that we, when we increase production, we use resources and we can never forget that. That's why it's so much more bang for our buck to invest in efficiency than it is to invest in more ways to build power. Unless the new ways to build power are supplanting dangerous, damaging ways, which they would in the first wave. If we could get rid of fossil fuels, then we don't have to have more turbines. We don't have to have more solar panels because we can concentrate on efficiency. And, you know, I was doing a little bit of a re bit of research on, you know, rare earth metals and cobalt and various things like that, 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 uh, and rare earth metals aren't rare. Uh, they exist everywhere on earth. Um, they're only called rare because you have to dig up so much dirt in order to find enough to use like gold. But every country has rare earth 
minerals. And we can have cell phones and computer screens and Game Boys without cobalt and rare earth metals, absolutely. They just add a little bit of sparkle. They add a little extra snap. They add a little bit more brilliance, but by no means are they essential. So I think if we could just back off from the arms race of having to have the latest, best, uh, clearest, sharpest, uh, whatever, uh, that we could get along quite nicely. But keeping in mind the, the original point you made, which I think is really important, every time we try to increase production, we use resources and create pollution. Great, thank you. Um, here's a, a very direct question. Are you questioning the capitalist system? Oh, I absolutely am. Ha, <laughs> yeah. Um, that has been the biggest mistake that, other than the uh, settled agriculture, that humans have ever made. And uh, <clears throat> the whole point of our economic system to make money, rather than feed people, or rather than house people, or, I mean, it's absolutely crazy. And um, that's why we have some people worth $162 billion and other people whose net worth is less than zero. And it is a corruptive, destructive um, way to run an economy. Why not nonprofit? Why not co-ops? Um, you know, if you have a little bit of profit left over, sure, pay your workers more or hire more workers so that they, and give everybody a four day week. Um, but this relentless screwing people in order to get the last penny out of them is destroying our culture. And the next question I think feeds into the last couple of things you said. Um, do we need to redefine what it means to be rich? Hmm. Absolutely. And we don't need to redefine it. All we have to do is pay attention to the people who have already redefined it, like most of the indigenous people in Canada, uh, like most um, uh, more traditional tribes, uh, traditional people have very different ideas of what it means to be rich. And this also gets back to marketing and advertising. We've been taught a false sense of wealth. And in under the capitalist guise of making a profit. Uh, you know, the supply and demand system doesn't work anymore. Well, in fact, it works just that way. Uh, we have supply first and then we create demand. And it works in that direction through the mechanism of advertising. I don't think anybody got up in the morning and said, geez, you know, what I really need is a hand cream that has tiny little beads of plastic in it, and that would feel so much better. I'm going to call Procter & Gamble and demand that they make that product. That never happens. Products are discovered. Somebody gets an idea, hey, maybe we could sell this. Uh, so what kind of advertising campaign do we need in order to create the demand so that we can make a profit off this product? Thank you. Um, so the next person is wondering, um, given what you have said about um, nuclear, what is Bill Gates missing? Why does he want to build his new plants and, consider, and continue to support that kind of energy? I have no idea what Bill Gates is thinking. <laughs> Sorry, I can't give you any insight on that. Sorry, I usually have more time to get to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hmm. A lot of thank yous in here and excellent talks. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, you can tell I enjoy it too. So it's, it's, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad it's good for, for other people. Um, so 
this person uh, is concerned that electrification is overlooking uh, some of the problems with batteries and otherwise um, and the amount of energy we consume. Um, why is it that we are afraid to tell people that they can't continue to live as we are? Don't we need to live much more simple lives? Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. We do need to live a much more simple life. But batteries are not really the problem in terms of electrification. Um, I just popped up a little graph where we, on the, on the uh, y-axis, it goes is time, seconds to days. On the x-axis is um, <clears throat> the uh, power, 10 kilowatts up to one gigawatt. And we have uh, electric storage methods for all different kinds of things. Uh, we can have um, high power capacitors, which give us a ton of power in a very short time. We can have compressed air, which gives us a fair amount of power over a fair amount of time. Um, we, and there are all kinds of lithium, you know, various kinds of batteries. Um, and, and there's also a fellow named Sadaway, S-A-D-O-W-A-Y, that is producing uh, 100% liquid batteries. I mean, there's all kinds of great new battery technology coming out. So I don't really think batteries are the problem um, in terms of electrification. Uh, I mean, we have a battery powered lawnmower, a uh, battery powered chainsaw, battery powered weed whipper, a battery powered car. Um, and it works and there's probably uh, well, uh, flashlights and cell phones and stuff. But I mean, we, we are fine. Although we have a source of excess power because we have 20 kilowatts of solar panels on our property uh, pumping out electricity uh, every time the sun shines. Um, but I think it's quite doable. We will have to invest in a more resilient grid uh, but we have to make those investments anyway. And we have to cut some of our ties. I mean, I, you probably remember when Co Quebec went black. Oh, was that, uh, oh, I'll bet it was 10 years ago now. Uh, because a tree branch fell on a wire in Cleveland. Well, that, by building out the grid the way we have, it doesn't make it more resilient. It just makes it more fragile. Uh, and, but I think those things can be addressed. But you're quite right. We have to address them and we have to think clearly about them. But I tend to think uh, that one of our answers is to electrify everything. And I probably don't know as much about it as I should, but that kind of appeals to me that if we could figure out, and we have, um, benign methods for producing electricity, then let's, let's use electricity. It was really too bad. You probably know that uh, Edison and Westinghouse uh, had a fight at the end, the uh, turn of the, uh, between the 18th and 19th century over whether Transmission lines would be AC or DC. AC can send power a long ways. DC is very good for local short distance generation. Einstein wanted to have a DC power plant on every block. Westinghouse wanted to have big honking power stations like um, Niagara and Tesla invented AC power, which is like a power pump goes back and forth, unfortunately, and uh, AC won. Even though Edison uh, electrocuted an elephant to uh, try to demonstrate how dangerous AC power was. Well, I think that was a mistake uh, th that we end, end, uh, ended up with huge honking power plants that ran on coal or oil or natural gas. And just now we're coming back, we still have AC, but we're coming back to more distributed, smaller energy production. And I think that's probably um, the direction that we'll go in.
That was a long answer, but did that give you enough time for the... Uh... <laughs> yes. Um, so there's just a couple more questions and, and maybe then we'll, we'll end it after these last two that are in here. Um, so uh, this one is about what about the to Tobin tax or marketing the taxi market transactions or taxing investment income higher than labor income? Oh, I think those are all fabulous ideas. I mean, a tenth of a cent on uh, transactions since most transactions are made by people in the top 5% of uh, your income or net worth, uh, that is a, a great idea. And um, I mean, whatever happened to taxing the wealthy? Uh, right now in the U.S., people, the 1% pay a lower percentage of tax than uh, the working class. Uh, it, it's just, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, when... Uh, Watson was the head of IBM. He paid 75% tax and he was still a wealthy man. Um, nobody certainly pays that now. Uh, and it's, uh, I mean, we, we don't have any kind, I don't think, any kind of graduated income tax system. There are so many loopholes and so many complications that uh, that's part of what I was talking about when I said we don't have a very resilient kind of or self-regulating kind of economy because the tax codes are a foot thick and it requires us to hire an expert to do our taxes. And that shouldn't, I mean, it should be one page and, and everybody should be able to do their own. Um, so yes, I really like a transaction tax and I really like um, a, a much steeper graduated income tax, along with a penalty for moving your money out of the country. Now, the U.S. can do this <clears throat> because the U.S. alone of all the countries in the world taxes people on the basis of citizenship, not residents. And it would be much easier for them to put in, put in a, you know, a, a tax on the rich because very few Americans are going to give up their citizenship for tax reasons. Some might, but not a lot. Um, unfortunately, Canada taxes people according to residence. And all you have to do is move away and take your money with you. Uh, so it probably wouldn't work quite as well here. Okay, thank you. And the last question is more about uh, the kind of things that you've been doing. Um, have you tried working through the faculty union to reach out to other campus unions or Kingston unions with your insights? Um, no, I haven't. Um, <clears throat> I'm still kind of developing them, but, I, but I'm really, I'm more interested in having students do that, you know, and teaching, um, you know, as much as I can. Um, <clears throat> Unions can be just as bad as management because they can be just as hard, they can have just as much hardening of the arteries if they're not properly uh, managed. Queen's Faculty Association, I think, is excellent. Uh, they're not like that at all. Uh, but there are so many sort of local issues going on that, um, although when, uh, when the students are, you know, working on divestment, I'm always encouraging them to contact all the unions in Kingston and, and get representatives and talk it over with them. And, and you know, I talked to uh, CUFA, the, the Queen's University Faculty Association, about um, coordinating with other unions. But I myself haven't gone out and actually done that one-to-one -one kind of uh, organization. I probably should. Uh, and, um, and I could, and it uh, sounds like a good suggestion. Uh, and I think that would help uh, maybe get a better picture of what works and what doesn't work. Great, thank you. Well, again, there's, there's lots of um, thank yous and um, you know, um, appreciation for the information and the talk that you gave. So. So thank you very much for that. Um, one person says uh, something that I'll echo um, that their takeaway is that to be a good ancestor. So, yeah. 
Absolutely, yes. Uh, if there's one thing you want to take away, I, that that's, would be my vote too. <laughs> well, I just wanted to also say thank you, Stephen. It's been very interesting and really um, uh, enlarged the scope of action that us climate activists can think about. So thank you for that. And thank you everybody mm, for your, your wonderful questions. And um, please join us next week at the same time to see Dr. Kathy Vakil, who's going to talk about um, health and climate change. And what are the medical consequences of climate change? And is there a prescription for a healthier world? Thank you very much, everybody. And see you next time. <laughs>